And then we are running today the startup funding in Frankfurt, how to raise money. Uh, this is an online event for uh, people interested in startups and funding. Um, we have today as panelists, uh, Tone Steenwinkel, uh, Vidya Munde Mueller, Alexander Suman, Carolina Yao, and uh, myself as the moderator for today's session. And um, we are going to be doing this as a informal panel um, where we'll be asking uh, several questions around fundraising and the organization of funding activity. And um, then having a Q and A uh, session, I'll be also sharing a little bit about the Founder Institute program before the Q and A. So let's begin then first with uh, introductions. Um, Tone, you are a mentor and advisor. You've been working with the Founder Institute, um, both in Cologne and in Frankfurt. Uh, you're a founding member of the uh, of Angel Engine. Um, what am I What am I forgetting? What else have you are you doing in the uh, as a business angel or as a in the startup area? Um, I'm also a mentor in a few other uh, organizations, but the most important ones are uh, the Founder Institute as well as Engine. Angel Engine, we are a uh, club of uh, about 40 business angels here in the Dusseldorf area. And uh, I advise, help, mentor, assist startups in uh, getting started and growing. I'm also, uh, my speciality is cross-border activities, which means that uh, since we're very close to the Netherlands here, uh, we also look at startups who, German startups who want to go into another country, like for instance, Holland and the other way around. So that's what I'm doing most of the time. Okay, great. And um, Alexander, you are the co-founder uh, and the chief marketing officer at Claim Compass. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there, what Claim, Claim Compass is. Uh, sure. So yeah, so um, I'm a co-founder of a travel tech um, startup called uh, Claim Compass, which um, is pretty much, I think you're familiar with the model in Germany, since it's been very popular there for, for the past couple of years, helping travelers get money when their flights are canceled or overbooked. So we've been around for uh, a little over six years. And um, last year, Given the pandemic, we actually took a turn and we expanded into the US. So we're actually back to square one. And we're working on a lot of early, um, you know, early stage uh, stuff with a new product and new model. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of still under the umbrella of the of the main of the main company. Um, yeah, the, so that's my kind of my full-time engagement, but on my spare time, I do like to uh, help out. Um, where I can. So uh, a bit of mentorship and advisory, different programs, um, different parts of the world, including the Founder Institute, um, which by the way is going on uh, for four, four and a half years, I think, uh, or mm -hmm. maybe five years that I've been uh, kind of uh, helping out startups. And uh, as of last year, um, I also lead a syndicate, uh, which backs early stage sector and geography agnostic founders. So, so far we've done a number of deals, uh, different verticals. So we aim at putting in between 100 and 150 per company. Uh, so if anyone is raising money, I think that's... Uh, and you, are you, you know, doing this in Germany discussion. or are you doing this in the US? Uh, so, so far we've done uh, mostly the US. Uh, we have one European deal, but uh, it's not necessarily you know, exclusive to the US, we just get a little bit more, you know, traction there. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we look at deals everywhere. Okay. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Uh, Vidya, uh, Vidya, you are an, an entrepreneur, uh, also an adjunct professor at Schiller International University, 
and you started uh, GiveTastic, and now you're a new director at the Founder Institute with us at Frankfurt. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, your story and what you're doing now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Eugenia. So I'm really excited to be here, and um, I, I hope that I get to connect to a lot of great people like Tone and Alex uh, through my new role at Founder Institute. And you're right, I'm teaching as well. Uh, bachelor of students at the Schiller Uni uh, International University in, um, in Heidelberg. So I founded the company Giftastic and we did raise a great good round from ATX after spring of Porsche. And we also scored some couple of awards. And yeah, I mean, I've seen the good side, but I've also seen the bad side. Um, so I have um, recently, because of some mistakes that I did, and maybe not the correct selection, uh, process. I think for co-founders, I, I uh, didn't couldn't save the idea as such, and um, I have seen the other side of startups as well. So I have seen the whole idea to market, to funding, to to bankruptcy. Uh, but hindsight 2020, I have learned a lot, and I hope that uh, through my new role at Founder Institute, I can help uh, entrepreneurs and guide them through this tricky tricky waters of entrepreneurship, especially when it comes to not only fundraising, but also the legal um, legal things that they need to take care of and the financial details, which are very essential. And I know I'm speaking from experience today, how difficult it is to raise funding as a founder, especially also female founder, one has to say that it's really a fact uh, because there are so less female, female founders on this um, um, in entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship area, I would say. And so I, I would like to talk about that as well. Like what can we do uh, to encourage more female founders to, uh, you know, go this path, which is not an easy path, but it is, it path. isn't an easy part. And there's a lot of uh, we're quite <laughs> behind in that area. Um, yeah, maybe Carolina, you can also talk about that. Uh, Carolina is a co-founder uh, of and ahead. And she is also a director of the Founder Institute with myself. Uh, and Karina, you went through the uh, Founder Institute Funding Lab, uh, so that's also quite the experience. Um, give us a little bit about your background and um, your experience in the funding space. Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks Eugene for this uh, introduction. Um, so my name is Carolina. I've uh, I'm from Singapore originally, and yes, uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, I became an entrepreneur after being ten years of a corporate employee. And Building and Ahead is also a project of the heart as we support individuals who are looking for uh, a change or a transition in their careers and helping them access to companies who appreciate and wants to build diversity within their teams. And uh, we are fundraising in the process. Uh, we also went through a grant process. So I think cash flow is one of the most important topics for any founders. Without cash flow, you know, it's easy to um, stop the process because of the lack of um, finances um, and funds. And I think the Fund Institute um, Funding Lab is definitely one that I would love to share a bit more later on as well. But the idea of making it a structured process, understanding that it needs a lot of time and effort and a lot of resilience as you go through it, as Vidya mentioned, um, and getting the ecosystem involved is one that I think is very interesting. And Founder Institute as being part of the director leadership, I think all the team here really wants to support early stage founders because this is the most fragile stage um, before we raise a seed funding or get you know uh, stability in revenue uh, sources. So definitely interested to hear what the rest of the panelists here have to say. And thanks for joining us, everyone. So thanks, Eugene. Okay, thanks. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. I think I would start then our discussion with really a simple question. Um, what's the starting point when somebody should start looking for funding? Um, who wants to address that? Anton? You want to give us uh, your thoughts on uh, when is, we should start looking for funding? It is never too early because I think as soon as you have kind of matured your ID and you think it's going to be uh, a startup, it's a, it's a business you want to do, then um, you start thinking about, you know, how, what am I? I'm I going to do? 
I've lost my screen. I'm back. Yes. Uh, so what are we going to do? What do I uh, have to have in resources in planning? When you do your planning and your first idea on resources and development, you also start thinking about money. And then you should already look around where are the, opp the opportunities to get some money. Because before you have found the right people, that's the subject of today, how to find people who want to invest in your company, it takes an awful lot of time. And then, so therefore, as early as possible, and you cannot say that in weeks, but as earlier than you, don't wait until you actually need the money, because then, it is uh, then you are about half a year up to a year late and you end up in trouble. That's my Alexander, opinion. you have the same thoughts or different thoughts on this? Uh, no, I from from a founder perspective, I do agree that, you know, the, the earlier, the better from an investor perspective, I think. Um, you know, when you're going out to raise money, you, you want to make sure that you can demonstrate that you have enough skin in the game um that you know the investor is not writing a check just uh uh to back you know something that you've come up with uh and have you know taken zero personal risk uh because it's just an unfair trade-off uh so i think you know realistically uh it has gotten so accessible to build uh you know at least a prototype or a first version of what you're trying to do and get some very early traction in order to demonstrate that to do uh, to a, a potential investor. So I think, um, you know, uh, if, if a founder approaches me, for instance, and says, you know, I have this amazing idea and I've built a landing page and I have, you know, a thousand signups and I'm raising, you know, 50, uh, I don't know, 50,000 or 150,000, I'd say, well, you know, a landing page and a bunch of leads is probably, you know, a weekend's worth of work or even less. So that's not really, you know, de-risked enough for me to take a bet. So I would actually want to see ideally more meat on the bone than, than just some very, very early stuff. So uh, it's a, I think it's, it's, it's a balance. And often, you know, if the founder is not ready to jump um, full time and commit full time to this uh, idea, this engagement, and it doesn't really start to sound like an actual company, then I think it's not really venture backable. It's not just a matter of timing. It's just that it's probably not, um, you know, there's not enough conviction on the founder side and let alone, you know, on the investor side. So uh, yeah, I think there's kind of a minimum set of expectations in terms of, you know, risk wise on, an, on the investor side that needs to be addressed before you can realistically go out and raise money. Nothing prevents you from, you know, going out and trying, but I think that the chances are very slim if there's really not enough to show for it. And I think those kinds of expectations um, probably vary and change depending on the individual, their history of uh, founding companies in the past. Uh, the trust levels may be very different depending on what you've done in the past. So, but for the, I think for the majority of Founders that are doing this for the first time, yeah, absolutely. If you're if you're at the very early idea stage, you need to be a little. You need to really have a solid plan and demonstrate that you're capable of moving forward. Um, obviously, the um, ability to get funding from um, from investors isn't the only option. Um, there's a landscape of funding options to consider uh, for very early startups. Um, any thoughts on um, non-equity funding or versus equity? What are the different options that people should be considering? Can I add? Can I add something? Can I add something to what I? Please go ahead. That there is the. Um, Many people, many found, potential founders are in the ID phase. And also if we, I talk, I lecture at universities and people have ideas and they're not yet founders. <clears throat> what we do is we set up a, uh, a meeting with them 
and we look at our 40 members, who is the best person to talk to, and then we have a kind of a, a brainstorming session. The potential founder says, this is the DID, what do you think about it? And I had such a session today, which was a, a really an excellent ID. And then you develop something. And then later on, you say, then you come to the phases of uh, setting up uh, uh, a first product, talking to customers, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, it's, it, it's a different case. But I have found, we have found that there is a need for potential founders to talk in a very early stage where the, the money is not an issue yet. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and, Lydia, and that's you free of to... charge. That's free of charge, of course. Oh, that's great. The, the ability to give input and provide you know, feedback on um, what works and what doesn't work is definitely going to help individuals uh, focus on the right things before the fundraising process. Vidya, you went through through um mm -hmm. actually you went through an accelerator to get funding initially all yeah. right um going through that process did you look at other um non-equity processes like uh, your own savings yeah. loans friends mm -hmm. and family um mm -hmm. how did you approach the the funding process mm -hmm. yeah so uh, just one one um I wanted to add one thought to what Anton and Alexander said about when to start fundraising. I agree with Anton, it should be as early as possible because it's for, in my case, it took me more than one year to come to that point that we got pre-seed. Uh, but I also agree with Alex that you need at least that, uh, some, some really a, a prototype which, is, uh, which has initial pilot, like it's a pilot uh, with potential customers that you can show some traction to the potential investors because then otherwise it's not so much, um, I think then it's more risk for the investors. So just wanted to add that um, you do need to do some homework and uh, then you can approach, I, I think uh, basically to have at least a workable prototype. To my um, case, I went through a couple of accelerators. So I, <laughs> I went through one accelerator which actually promised uh, funding, but because of their, um, so it was a, a accelerator in Hanover, um, which I joined in 2019 for three months. Um, it was supposed to be that there was funding for all uh, or not, uh, for all four startups which were selected from a list of 50 startups. But unfortunately they had some, how do you say, uh, uh, some abuse or mis uh, misuse of funds happening. Uh, the one person who was doing it and somehow then it didn't come to funding. So this can also happen at Accelerator, uh, I must warn that you go there and you think, oh, you're going to get funded. Uh, and I would have at least got 35K there and uh, it didn't happen. So I was disappointed. But then I went through another accelerator where I applied uh, with the APX and that's where we uh, got our pre-seed funding. Uh, but I have also seen the other side of uh, fundraising. Uh, I applied for grants um, and in Germany, that's a great thing in every like basic state like Niedersachsen or Lower Saxony or Bayern uh, and so on, you can get scholarships or grants. And I got like two grants from the government of Niedersachsen because I was in, based in Hanover at that time. And uh, so it was a scholarship money. Uh, so it was 2000 euros per month for, uh, it was eight months actually, but it, they extended it because of Corona to, to three more months. So it was a great, um, I mean, I, I found it was very helpful, uh, but it was very bureaucratic. And if I was not in that accelerator in Hanover, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have got access to the fundraising part because, or I wouldn't have access to the grants because the decision for grants is a very like, um, you know, the, it was from Nida's Axon, the state, and they trust the ecosystem partners. So they trusted the accelerator that they will make the best choice. And so that's why it was easy for me to get the grant but for somebody who is applying from thousands of applications that come through, I think um, it's difficult to get grants and it's quite bureaucratic. It took me a lot of uh, investment of time to get those grants. So, but, but we got like eventually, um, so I got around like uh, some grant for the, uh, uh, for the office space and some grant for my own personal uh, expenses. So it was nice. Yeah, I think, I mean, overall, what I see in, in Germany and definitely in each of the 
Bundesländer, is really the idea that there are a lot of different grants, there's a lot of different opportunities for finding funding, but it's a very administrative process. Carolina, we went through that ourselves. Uh, do you want to mention around the uh, complexity or the difficulty uh, or the slowness of the process of uh, finding funding, even though it's great that we got funded in this way, um, I, uh, it was a process. Yeah, I was just looking through um, earlier this week about how much time we actually spent. Uh, we started investigating grants June last year, 2020. Um, that uh, we found out uh, about the grant from Founder Institute's uh, one of the graduates uh, of FI who got the grant. So I think it's also important to when you and when anyone here who decide to go through the grant process to get your, you know, your advisory board informally right in place. Uh, founders who have got the grant before. We had grant advisors from TU Darmstadt as well joining us. So we got a federal grant from the Bundesministerium uh, von Wirtschaft und uh, Energie, which is like the uh, Economic Affairs and um, Energy um, Department. They're responsible for a lot of the digitization uh, projects here in Germany. And for us, I think the money is good to have. Obviously, we started to hire our team. Um, but I think more than that, it gives us credibility within the German ecosystem. So it helps us later on to also get, I think, uh, the next step with uh, fundraising as a process. We know of other founders who were part of this process and they got their first term sheets after they, read, they got their grant because it kind of gives a bit of a stamp of approval there. Every little thing helps. Um, and the time fr frame in the end, uh, after the introduction, we started in February, the actual application, and we got the yes in October. So it was eight, nine months worth of um, not full time, but still team effort coming in, um, presenting, and uh, the whole process was in German. Um, so we were fortunate to have also Britta, I think she's also in the call today, who is our German representative that could uh, support us in the process. Eugene, I think you did most of the work uh, planning it out uh, for the team as well. So it's, I think it it's still a worthwhile process, but it is definitely time consuming and it's important Absolutely. to target the client that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Anton, I know that you have um, given the advice in the past that um, it's useful to uh, use specialized consultants uh, when figuring out which programs to apply for, how to can, uh, figure out the programs that are good matches. Uh, you've talked about the ESF exist, uh, the BMW E programs. Um, any thoughts on, has that changed or it's still a very much a process where uh, it's very valuable to get a specialized consultant to assist you. Um, <clears throat> if it are things like uh, from the, uh, the various states in Germany, you can do it yourself. You can find a contact person, they're normally very accessible, and it's quite clear what you have to do in order to get these grants. And here in North Rhine Westphalia, you can you get a, a thousand euros per month for a period of uh, of one year, and you have to be in, you have to have an innovative idea. As soon as it becomes more complex, like for instance European things, then you're you're lost. Then you have to find uh, somebody who helps you, a good advisor, a good con consultant. Um, if you look at the uh, the other uh, packages which are available, the more money you need and the further it's away from the state where you actually are uh, setting up, trying to set up the business, the more complex it becomes, then you definitely some, need somebody who helps you because um, they speak a different language, these people. The, uh, one of the very international words is bureaucracy, bureaucracy. And it's the, same, it's the same word in many languages and it's also the same machinery. And it's, it's slower, you have to know exactly how the system works. And of course you can do it yourself, but you know, I've been involved in European projects and out of the three, I think it was three we were working on, we've given up two because it's, the bureaucracy was eating us up. And at, at the end, you spend more time 
shoving paper than doing doing actually do work. So uh, I think it was a very good suggestion to listen to other people who have done it, who were successful, get their uh, experience and, and take it from there. If you have your, your you want to have seed investments up to let's say two, three, four and a thousand euros, you don't have to go to the European Union and and um, you can stay more locally, like for instance the uh, North Rhine Westphalian Bank. You can you can go there, and talk to them, and get that advice. So experts, once you need a lot more money and you want to have European things. That would be my say on it. Yeah, no and we found, I mean, we no found that the administrative cost tends to be pretty high. Yeah. You know, it's going to take you quite a bit of effort to um, every month address. So you need to make sure that the amount of funding that you're getting from these programs actually makes sense. Um, Alexander, in your, you know, you're working with two structures, one in Europe, one in, in the US. Uh, have you had experience with that kind of fundraising? Uh, I have not. Um, so we have raised exclusively from uh, micro VCs uh, and from angels. So um, I, in all honesty, I have really no experience whatsoever with grants or any non equity funding. Um, so I wouldn't really be able to comment on that. I, I think, yeah, I think you've addressed most of it. I mean, my, con my concern would be if I were, you know, starting a new company and exploring that, that option versus the venture route, I, I just feel like I know the VC world a little bit better. So I know what they're looking for and it kind of aligns a little bit with my expectations as well. So it's very, it's much closer to the business I feel, uh, mm -hmm. versus, um, I have been, on some committee of appraisal of some EU backed projects. And I have reviewed a couple and it just feels that it's such a cumbersome process, which in my opinion is so far from, you know, what the company is actually going to end up doing uh, that it sounds at least on the outside as a bit of a dis distraction uh, and, you know, unnecessary overhead, but at the same time, if that's the only funding that you could get your hands to and uh, your hands on, it's it's better than nothing. It's better than shutting down. So I assume that, you know, it's uh, it's worth exploring at some point. What about matching funds? Did you, who here has had experience with matching funds, whether there are, um, for example, the high tech uh, Brunder fund, uh, fund? Yeah, we, we have uh, experience with them. They are a very, uh, powerful group and um, they're very accessible you know you can set up a meeting with them it's good if you have a pitch deck you can upload it on their website and you will find uh, good people you can talk to who give you advice in a relatively early stage and they have in invested that's the biggest uh, fund, I think they have altogether invested something like three billion, and uh, you can raise there in the, the first phase maximum uh, one million they will finance, and later on in in continuing other uh, investment round they go up as as far as uh, three million euros, and uh, they have a huge network uh, in investors uh, and companies who come to the high-tech Grunderfold to say, look, we're looking for a certain company or do you have some good uh, startup? So they're very, they're very useful. Another useful thing is, I think, is the EXIST program. The mm -hmm. EXIST program is something where out of the university of the Hogeschool, the business school, you want to set up a company and you want to start, you make yourself independent. And uh, nowadays, most universities and business schools have somebody who takes care of that. And they, that person will assist you in applying for the funds. And it's a very useful program. And they also have a lot of money. So the exist, okay. the exist is really useful if you want to set up a company coming 
out of the university or a business school. And um, then in terms of, you know, if you think about programs like those that are matching programs or that are, uh, some of them are non-equity programs. Uh, Anton, the, the Grunder Fund has a, has a, as an investor, it has a leverage impact. So the amount of, uh, amount of money that an angel is going to be in, investing is more powerful because of the uh, Grunder Fund. What is your thinking around that kind of leverage and the ability of these funds to um, make in angel investors more, um, more impactful? Uh, and another example, but it, it, it answers part of your question, is, for instance, the uh, North Rhine Westphalian Bank. They have uh, a program and whereby if... Uh, a business angel says, look, I'm going to invest 100,000 in your company. They, dub they double it. They put in another 100,000 and let the, the business angel run the, 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 the money and manage the, uh, the business with the startup. And that's, of course, an excellent opportunity if the high-tech Corona Fund see sees this. It's an excellent opportunity to say, look, we have an angel on board, and it doesn't have to be 100,000, it can be 50,000. The NRMA, North Rhine Westphalian Bank, puts it, has put in another 50, 100,000, but we need more money in the next phase, and then you have uh, an excellent start. Any other thoughts uh, from anyone else on the, the specialized funds or... or um... mm -hmm. Video, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Um, so I was in the, one of the offices in Berlin of this Tank Grunder Fund, uh, and I did have a pitch. But what came out of that was that I think they are looking, um, I mean, Anton has naturally much more experience, but they were looking for a really bigger impact thing. They want to see a bigger market behind your idea. So I wouldn't necessarily think that they are an option if your market is less than, I don't know, 100 million. I mean. They really need a big market, I think. Uh, then they are very, very happy, I think. Um, so that was one takeaway that I had. And uh, Anton was telling about this exist. So I had had a couple of founders uh, in, in Hanover as well who got exist, and they were mostly coming from university. I think you need at least one founder coming from the university to get it. But one thing I can tell is that that process is so much bureaucratic. It's like it, it took for the application, some founders said they took, six months till a year to just apply. And then you get the funding, it's nice. It gives you enough money to have like three full-time founders just doing that uh, or even more because the money is quite good. But, um, and then you have to apply again if you want then again after one year to, uh, you know, raise another round with them. Um, but I would say, I mean, I would just warn everybody that first of all, you need somebody from the university coming from the university to apply for that. And secondly, it's quite bureaucratic. If you want to spend six months doing nothing but on that, um, but the application, then of course, go ahead. And for some people, it's quite okay, because if you're studying, it's maybe a possibility. But if others want to get it faster, I, I would say maybe focus on your idea and maybe you can get, a, get some other ways of funding. Then let's talk a little bit about other ways of funding. Um, I think that's a good intro to crowdfunding, for example. You know, crowdfunding in Europe is now really large. There's over a thousand platforms. Uh, I hear that 20 billion euros in investments have taken place from these uh, crowdfunding platforms. Um, the type of companies that I have run don't fit well for crowdfunding. So from my own experience, I, I haven't used these platforms, but I'd like to ask uh, all of you, uh, what are your thoughts on using crowdfunding? I have a little ex little experience, but not so good. I, With a friend, we were setting up a company in, um, in the financial area, and uh, we wanted to have money and we thought crowdfunding was a good idea. And uh, we had a lot of interest from the people, but in the end, it didn't work out really well. And uh, 
So we decided to go back to um, family and friends. And then and a- um, Why do you think a, it didn't work out really well? Well, the, 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 you have to talk with and interact with a lot of people. And then in the beginning, they're very interested in, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I love to invest, but what about this, 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 and this? And that's okay if you have three business angels talking to, but uh, in the crowdfunding, people are uh, less experienced in investing in, in um, potential companies, potential startups. So therefore they're going to, uh, they have asked, at least that was my experience, quite a few stupid questions. Uh, and uh, so in the end, we, we gave it up. I assume that the platforms are now better organized. Okay. So part of it is less, there's a lot less investors. I think there's also a question around, you know, you have to have a good story. Uh, crowdfunding yeah. works when you have a, a product that you have a, a great vision. I could see for video, your give Tastic would have might have been a crowdfunding uh, project. Why didn't you go there? Or did you think about using crowdfunding as a, as a channel? Yeah, I mean, I first of all, I was not that experienced with crowdfunding. What I've heard is that, I mean, even though the platforms are now more better structured, I heard that you have to raise some round, a uh, part of what you are trying to collect. Like if you want 10,000, then maybe 1,000, you have to collect uh, through your friends and others to support you till they start promoting you. At least that was the information that I had in my head that uh, it wouldn't be successful if you didn't raise a little bit of percentage yourself um, so that they promote you. The other part, I, I, I think I didn't really take it that seriously for tech businesses. I, I thought, um, of course we are tech and we are trying to be social, but I, I, I was thinking more the venture path was the, the more ideal path or is still, I think, uh, to some extent an ideal path uh, to, to grow the, you know, and if you take the money from the crowdfunding, maybe you raise the first, like you can't raise so much. You will raise maybe some thousands. That's nothing compared to like the pre seed that we raised, right? From Axel Finger and Porsche, that was much higher and easier to deal with. Just, uh, just like Anton was saying, not uh, thousands of people who are asking questions, but to deal with. Uh, but you know what? It's, I'm very curious. And maybe next year I am thinking about launching a crowdfunding around another idea of mine. But let's see how it works out. Here. Okay, well, wish you luck with the, the crowdfunding exercise. Um, from what I've heard, you know, a large part of it is making sure that you develop your network, that you've got good mailing lists, that you are using the platform as an extension of uh, e-marketing campaigns of a network of individuals who are really interested in sharing your message and sharing your story of why your product or your company um, should be supported. Uh, by lots of different people, um, which I think brings us to the idea of what are the aspects, what are the most important aspects of preparing for fundraising? I think that that's going to be really um, my last question before we go over to uh, the Q&A. So um, your thoughts, uh, Alexander, why don't you start off on what is, um, what's really the most important aspects of preparing for fundraising or but from both sides, both as someone who's raised and someone who is an investor, um, you know, not only what are the important aspects, but um, what makes it impactful for you so that as an investor, you you're, you're think you're going to uh, be willing to uh, put your money into a, into a project. Um, yeah, so that's a, so that's a very, uh that is a very broad um, topic. I think there's multiple aspects. So on the founder side, um, there's a number of, so, so it, is a, it is a process and you, you should treat it as such. So um, it's a very structured process. So, you know, a, a common misconception is that you will um, just email a bunch of investors uh, with a one-liner or with a, you know, with a deck and then you hope for the best and then you would hear back. Um, I, I don't think that that really works in the majority of the cases. Uh, there's a minimum number of fundraising assets, if you will, that you can, that you should prepare to increase your chances for success. 
Um, so aside of actually having a venture backable business and an idea and having, you know, something to show for it, um, your next steps would be to prepare a, uh, a short deck, a long deck and a blurb um, of, of sorts. So your kind of your process is going to look as, uh, as such where you use the blurb to ask for introductions. You know, you should always start by trying to build that network and be able to have an introduction to a uh, to a VC. I mean, going the you know the code, the code outreach is ex extremely difficult in the uh, in the venture world. So I don't think that really works for the majority of the companies. Um, so try to build out that network as early as you can. Connect with people. Uh, NFX, uh, you know, is a great uh, venture capital firm led by James Courier. They have uh, a platform called Signal. So that platform actually has a bunch of uh, investors so you can start understanding a little bit of what is the venture capital landscape out there so who is a, a good investor for what you're trying to build you know it makes no sense to pitch uh, you know if you're a direct to consumer you know hardware product or of sorts uh, you know it doesn't really make sense to pitch somebody who like Jason Lemkin who only invests in SaaS businesses for example so you know do your research and make sure that you've tailored your pitch and your deck um, to that particular uh, investor, um, you know that's that's kind of the absolute minimum. Um, on the investor side, I think you put yourself in the shoes of an investor. Uh, they normally um, see between eighty to a hundred decks per week. So, in order for you to stand out, uh, clarity is number one. So that's why um, you're not sending a business plan. You know, the, one of the things that I often see is that you know the deck is treated as a business plan and there's like a bunch of text on it and there's a bunch of spreadsheets um, and that's a massive cognitive overhead that you know just just makes me close the deck and move on to the next one because I'm not going to invest a lot of time trying to figure out what is it that you do um, unless it comes a, a, across clear um, it might be that you know uh, as an investor I'm probably missing out on a lot of good opportunities but that's you know that's that's how you decide to uh uh, I, I think that's how most investors um, decide uh, on whether or not they're going to dive a little bit deeper. So make sure that what you're building is communicated clearly uh, on the deck. It's convincing. Understand that you're not going to be able to tell everything in your five-year vision in a deck. So your goal with the short deck is to get on the, on the first call, potentially a second call, um, and then let the investor lead, let the investor ask the questions, you know, don't rush into telling everything that you, you have to say, just say whatever is of interest to the investor to understand the decision making process. So those are some of the kind of high level things that come to mind. And I'm going to let the others comment as well. Anton, you have a bit of a different process. I think that your decks uh, or your expectations for your angel network were to have a thicker deck set. Is that true? Uh, some thoughts or differences in thinking? First of all, I think Alexander mentioned quite a, quite a few very interesting points. Um, you have to get visibility. And uh, there are uh, here in the Northern and Westphalian area, but also in the rest of Germany, many uh, events where startups pitch. And uh, of course, we listen to these, we, we go to these events. Now it's all virtual, so we, we can go, I can have, two sessions per day with startups. And then you create visibility, you have heard from them, and you have to be very enthusiastic and precise when you are presenting. And uh, we discussed uh, hours on what is the most important thing for us to have a look at, a uh, more deeper look into, um, potential startup to, to, to be financed. And I, I actually, I was proud to, I came up with the thing is, you have to fall in love with the idea of the startup. And that's what it is. You know, if you don't fall in love as an investor, and don't take it literally, but you have to fall in love with the ideas, geez, this is a super idea. Then um, make sure it's, it's a KISS principle, keep it simple for the stupid so people understand it. No buzzwords and then you get into 
the the next phases and there there's a whole list of things uh, we want to see and a good pitch deck and a business plan i think we like to know about the team what team do we have uh, do they have advisor what about the, the the leadership they have and we also expect clear thinking in this in the sense of mission vision goals strategy and an action plan and that you can put in a in a pitch deck but also in a conversation and then we have lists of things they have to do in order to keep the bureaucratic bureaucratic cookie monster eating and working so we have a whole process but it's it's doable yeah and i think that you know that's part of you having gone through the process of pitching uh for uh, a variety of different types of angels i think that that's also part of the as a founder you have to have a decision process of this is the content that i'm showing this is what makes sense for me yeah. um the advice that you get from different people you need to make a you have to filter it out and figure out what is valuable and what is uh contradictory yeah like alex was saying there are you have pitches whereby uh there, for instance there are a lot of techies in in the audience who look at technical things you have to have you have to answer or, or potentially answer the technical questions if you have more the finance people then it's more financial if you have more the sales and marketing people you have to address to you have to go towards that so you have to know who your audience is when you're pitching to them and you also have to know what kind of in, in particularly with uh, angels what kind of an investor is it uh, does he uh, does he have a lot of money he just wants to invest money or is it an extension of the business or is the person want to spread the knowledge and experience with he or she pre previously gathered in other jo jobs. You have to find that out in advance. Who am I talking to? And then you can yeah. fine tune your story towards the person. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, you definitely have to have uh, something, your presentation or your content needs to be understood by um, by your audience. So it needs to be understood at the level of a 14 year old, as I think Anton, you've mentioned that in the past, it has to be extremely clear whether yep. you're doing the technical aspects or the financial aspects, it should always be extremely clear communications. Yes. Um, then let me just quickly um, cover what we're doing at the Founder Institute, take a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll go to the Q&A uh, questions. So I'm going to share my screen and give an overview of um, our program, and then we'll come back to the Q and A. So, uh, what's the Founder Institute? We are the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. We're present in two hundred cities. Uh, we have over now over seventeen thousand mentors and five thousand alumni, and we've uh, helped startups generate value of uh, an excess of thirty billion dollars. Um, across the world through raising and funding. Um, and um, we position ourselves really at the pre-seed accelerate stage. There are many other programs, uh, some excellent programs that are uh, a little bit later, seed accelerator, angel programs, or seed and VC programs. And there are inspirational educational programs that can be either weekend programs or um, online, purely online programs that are in itself uh, managed programs. We focus on the area of starting an idea and creating a business. So really the zero to one stage. Um, idea, getting your MVP team in place, getting your early company set up. And those are the, really the standard or the advanced tracks of FI where we expect the person that goes through these programs through one of our programs to develop their vision to get the the idea validated to learn how to pitch and then follow the necessary aspects so that they have a go-to-market plan they are able to 
begin their product development, they are thinking about how, how they're going to build their traction or starting traction, uh, what is going to be the repeatable revenue, and then the thoughts around funding. And all of this is really the pre-seed early stage of uh, company building. Uh, our program runs for 14 weeks. So during this three and a half months, we cover week by week in uh, an evening program, uh, a variety of sessions that allow us to focus on very specific topics. And then we run these, um, this as business prints with the expectation that for those that graduate from the program, it's a tough program, then they can go on to uh, attend post programs, either in funding or in growth um, to continue to develop their, their company. And it's, uh, it's not just a one-off, people who participate in the uh, Founder Institute then have alumni perks. Uh, they have the, the network of alumni, network of graduates, they have access to mentors across the world. Um, and it's the expectation that they'll be able to use this network to continue to develop their company. And then um, as Carolina mentioned, she went through the Founder Lab, uh, the Funding Lab. So there's uh, post program, uh, structured programs that help on very specific topics like Funding Lab and like uh, the Growth Lab. Um, and what are the results and who's graduated from FI? You've probably heard of some of these like uh, Udemy or Kindara. Um, in Europe, we have PRB and in Asia, uh, I've uh, seen Apota and Start are a couple of the companies that have graduated. They've raised quite a bit from investors. Um, the network, as I mentioned, is a very important part of the Founder Institute. You have specific uh, mentors, both in Frankfurt and across Germany, uh, and then international uh, mentors to help uh, growth activity. Our team in Frankfurt is five of us, myself, Britta, Carolina, that's also online, Vidya, uh, just joined us uh, recently, and as did uh, Maria, they're the new directors as of the, uh, this new, our next upcoming cohort. And then these are some of the graduate companies from, uh, from Frankfurt. And uh, the last slide I'll be sh showing is just a reminder of um, our next semester starts on the uh, 23rd of March, but we have two deadlines, a discount deadline is February 6th, then the final deadline will be the 13th of March uh, for a semester that starts in March and ends in June. If you have questions, you can reach out to any of us or you can learn more at the fi.co website. So then let's get now, um, let's move over to the Q&A from, from the audience. Um, we have the first question is, uh, what if you don't need money until product market fit um, uh, and money would accelerate the pro your progress? Um, I guess the question here is, should be should you should you be thinking about funding or not? Um, is it are your thoughts around if you can you know if you don't need money until uh, product market fit? Should you be fundraising? Vidya, you wanna? I just wanted to say that it's great if you don't need funding, <laughs> but if you want to really grow and venture is there to really grow. I mean, you want to do ten x, you know, you want to have a Google kind of, um, I mean, that is the vision. But um, I mean, there is another way you can do it bootstrapping. So you can do it yourself. You don't need extra uh, investors. Um, and I have seen um, the pros and cons of having investors. So if you have investors, the clock gets started. And um, I think that if the clock starts, then they expect you to come with some numbers. They want a monthly recurring revenue. They want to see potential customers. They want to see your pipeline. They want you to push the sales and marketing like, and you will come under the pressure. Not that it's always bad. It sometimes really pushes you and it's good. But I have seen that from, in my personal case, I was quite under pressure in that time um, when it was crucial not to be so much under pressure, to, to, to think, you know, it's cool somehow and not to, um, I mean, even though the investors were very good, nothing against them, but the clock gets started. And I think if you can avoid it, 
um, and you can bootstrap the process and raise it like through your family or friends, then do that till the moment that you're comfortable with and really want to do the 10X then. Anyone else want to address that question? I think that's absolutely wonderful. If you don't need money, pre-product markets fit, then uh, uh, I don't know, send me a message and tell me what you're building because uh, it sounds really, really exciting. Because um, the reality is that investors that join pre-product market fits take a massive risk. Um, and that's reflected on the valuation. So for example, if I'm investing in pre-product market fit, I'm probably looking for a company unless it's you know, a YC backed company you're probably looking to invest at, you know, around 5 million valuation, right? Because everything about your company is, uh, is unproven. So I'm taking a massive risk. So I want to have, you know, the, the potential of a massive return consequently. But if you're post product market fit, then um, a lot of that has already been addressed. So which means that you can go and you can raise at a much higher valuation because post product market fit, likely you're starting to look for growth capital. Um, so the investors that are going to join um, are going to join because they believe that, you know, they're going to invest, uh, you know, maybe 50, uh, 50 million or 100 million. And that's going to take you to, you know, potentially unicorn status. Um, and your valuation is going to be much, much higher. So the, the trouble that I see with, you know, the way that that question is framed is that a lot of founder, founders have a very, um, a very uh, like a great misconception of what product market fit actually is and what it looks like and what it feels like. And it's much, much harder to get the product market fit with funding or without funding. It's extremely difficult. So that's why people end up raising money because it is very, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's difficult. Um, and it requires capital upfront in order to be able to get the product market fit. So um, if you are in a position where you're trying to make that decision and balance things out. And, and, you know, you're wondering about, should I take money now or should I wait? Ask yourself, you know, are you really confident that you are actually nearing product market fit? And what does that actually mean for your business? You know, are your users or your customers uh, sticking with you for a very long periods of time, you know, due to unit economics work um, and so forth? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to bounce off of that and also mention, you know, one of the things you have to consider is your speed to market. And you probably have competitors, maybe not the exact same products, but, you know, they're developing their own product market fit. They're, they're capturing their own market. So one of the ideas there is you may want to look for investment, even though, you know, you can grow slowly because the environment around you is changing. So making sure that you are leading in your class uh, is another reason why investment can be really important. Um, it, you may be able to grow without it, but you know, you may get eaten, your market may get eaten a bit by, by competitors. Yeah. I just want to add that I think, uh, uh, so personally, my mind changed uh, in the beginning. Uh, fundraising was a scary topic for me, uh, personally, because I've never had anyone uh, around me fundraise before. Um, joining FI, I think, changed my mind a lot, speaking with all the different mentors and advisors and familiarizing, I think, ourselves with the uh, skill set to fundraise is a very important point. So even if you don't want to fundraise, uh, you should understand because as a founder, we need to understand where to get funding and cash flow, whether is it from governmental, whether is it from private equity, whether is it a loan uh, from a bank, um, because there will be a day that we require cash flow because of the ups and downs of the market. Um, then the other point I think is um, having investors, the right ones on board. I think that's one of the questions that addressed it uh, earlier on. Is, is actually a good thing because they put uh, skin in the game. Um, they can also support the growth process. Um, it's very, definitely very important to bring the right ones on board. Um, Haida Grunefond, for example, has a connection to many corporate companies uh, across Germany. Um, and when they invest in a company, uh, we as founder definitely then need to look into how we leverage such networks. Um, because they do support, but they also have a few hundred uh, startups in their portfolio. Um, and if you get invested from APX or Heidegger Grunefond or any of these funds, they then you know, help you 
also grow in terms of sales and marketing. Um, so I think it's important to see them as allies, uh, even if it's friend and family with skin in the game. Uh, they also tend to then support in the growth process. Okay. Uh, Suhas asks, um, so this is, a, this is a bit of a difficult question, but uh, how much of an investor's advice should be taken into consideration for the product's direction? Um, who wants to take that one first? It, it depends on what kind of investor you are looking for. If you're looking for a financial investor, then you cannot expect that the person who then provides the money knows, know, knows a lot about your product. I think that's one of the strengths of business agent networks. You can look for a business angel uh, who has, first of all, money, secondly, who has experience in your business and then can help you, mentor you, and also uh, guide you on your product. So, but there has to be a good fit, a good connection between the knowledge and experience of the of the um, the investor, the, the business angel, and the startup which is developing the product. Because there might the, the I have specific knowledge in certain areas where startups who have just started, they do not have that experience, they do not have that knowledge. Because I've been working in that area for dozens of years. And the same with other business angels who know, who have their own company and they know how to build products and they can give you advice and how, to what extent you're taking on their, uh, taking over their advice. That depends on you because the startup uh, owner is the entrepreneur, therefore has to take the decision. But you and, pick, pick the brains of the um, of the investor if he or she has the right knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think that's also linked to the next question, which is, um, what are the thoughts of you know the difference between taking just taking money and taking any money? versus finding uh, what would be a suitable investor, um, an, an advisor and an investor. Um, Alexander, from the investor side, um, what about the fit between suitable investor or just, just taking money? Um, so my, my approach to this is from an investor's perspective, I think um, would be I'm not actively trying to get involved with the company. So as much as I might be excited about the company, um, because I've been on the founder side and I understand how far from the business and the day-to-day the -day -day operations investors actually are. So it is, to me, for the most part, unrealistic to expect that they can have you know, a meaningful input uh, which does not also exclude, you know, on occasion having, um, being able to help with some very specific questions, for instance, you know, can you help out to, um, you know, close this investor or can you do an introduction to this company or, or uh, you know, that potential customer. Uh, so I think, you know, approach it with, um, you know, if, as you know, echoing from what Anton said, I, I totally agree that, you know, especially on the angel, um, if you're doing an angel round, there are angels that can be incredibly helpful in the early stages, especially if they come from an industry background. Um, and especially if they're joining as angels, because they're, you know, they're rooting for you and they're, they're, they're looking at you as a single investment um, in a single company um, that is going to return their money, their own personal capital. While if you're speaking to a VC, to you know, a general partner um, that manages a fund or a micro VC, you know, their goal is fundamentally different from that of the angels. So they're looking at, uh, you know, how is this company going to, you know, 10x or 100x uh, or 1,000x my entire portfolio? Um, so the dynamics are very, very different. And hence, you know, they're probably investing in, you know. 20 to 50 companies a year so it's imagine the you know the, the the time and effort that it would require for them to be up to date and being able to have like a material impact on every single company in their portfolio so for the most part i don't really expect a vc 
to be uh, incredibly helpful with, you know, uh, building the product and, and the daily operations. They could be helpful with, you know, some other things such as, you know, raising, rallying up more investors to join or, you know, helping you sell the company or, you know, helping you uh, acquire talent. Um, but for the most part, you're running the business and um, you are deep down in the weeds. So I wouldn't really expect that an investor is going to have that same insight. Mm -hmm. I would even, I mean, I think we could even go further sometimes. Carolina, you and I had a discussion a while back around um, institutional investors and uh, the potential for confl conflict of interest where, where some institutional investors um, may have ideas of why they're placing money in your company that are very different than your, uh, your own objectives. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Eugene, I was just thinking about that as you brought it up. I think uh, as part of the funding lab process, uh, this was one of the questions that we as a team had um, in terms of institutional investors. And I think I was, I was a bit personally surprised. Uh, I would love to hear the panelist uh, uh, thoughts here because I think the, the corporate investors or institutional investors, um, if they, for example, invest uh, from the, the funds of one single company, I think there are many possibilities of conflicts of interest. Um, potentially the company could look at this investor investment as part of their innovation strategy, part of their acquisition strategy. Um, and if the investment is significant um, as part of the whole investment portfolio um, that we've fundraise for, then there could be potential conflicts down the road. And many of those who have raised money previously in the Founder Institute e ecosystem have advice against it. So Eugene, anything to add here, but this was the general concept. Um, but if, for example, if it's a, a couple of corporate investors uh, putting you know, uh, money into a fund to support the funding uh, ecosystem, then the conflict becomes much less. Um, but we'd love to hear the panelists thought here as well from the rest. I think there's there's nothing more to add than what Caroline has said. Caroline has said. Um, I also um, I I fully agree with uh, Carolina. I think um, I, I, so your question, Eugenia, was specifically about corporate um, investors. Yeah, I was talking about. Have, I mean, we oh. had this discussion. Carolina and I had a discussion around one particular investor uh, who shall remain uh, unnamed, uh, where some of our advisors, and this is really actually, this is a great uh, experience because we have, you know, you listen to an advisor and an advisor is going to say, do this or don't do this. And at the end of the day, you have to make the decision and filter through that process and, and say, you know, is this solid advice? Does it make sense? And uh, for us, our thinking was, well, in this, or my thinking was, uh, uh, this advice doesn't make sense because the fear of institutional investors in the US is very different from European institutional investors. Uh, we should think about this differently and we should actually consider having discussions with them because those conflicts of interest may not exist in Europe or for this mm -hmm. particular investor. So I think it's, it, there's two things going on here. The type of advice that you get from experienced investors or experienced fundraisers or experienced founders may not fit your situation. So you need to filter through that on one side. And then the other side is, yeah, when you're raising money, whether it is angels or, or Vidya had a bad experience with a, a funding structure that fell apart, um, you know, going after any kind of money uh, or whether it's institutional or whatever type of structure, you know, you're spending a lot of time that you could be spending Otherwise, it ha that has a cost for you and costs some time and effort. So you have to think about, um, do I accept conversations with anybody or do I really focus my fundraising to very specific targets that are going to be good fits? And then it's more difficult to raise funds because I'm reducing my target, uh, the number of investors. For me, there has to be a balancing act. And... Um, I don't have the answer to how, what's the best way to balance that, but I think it's a challenge to figure out how to find 
the right investors and the right money. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, from um, I've I've given this a little bit of thought in terms of you know corporate innovation and corporate VCs and and how they operate. And my take on this is that for the most part, um, purely from like a venture capital um, standpoint, they don't work. Uh, so you know you can think of large corporations that have these programs in place. Um, and, you know, they have several uh, billion in revenue. Like, what is this going to do if they were to invest like 100K or like they're running an internal accelerator of like 20 companies? What is this going to do on the bottom line? They're not in the business of venture capital of, you know, managing and deploying a fund. So that leads me to believe that there's most likely a different strategy there. So they're probably outsourcing a portion of their innovation to these startups and they're, you know, they're, they're just accelerating that. So you, you want to keep that in mind and, and think, okay, so what is that investor really going to do for me? And what are their expectations? And what's, which direction are they going to push me towards compared to, let's say, a, a traditional VC that is investing early stage, you know, seed to pre-seed? Um, and, uh, and, and how is that going to impact my journey? So I, I agree that there's definitely different types of dynamics at play depending on the investors. Okay. I think, yeah, I think that's a real, uh, that kind of thoughtful process as you, as you go look for uh, investors is really a, a very important aspect of your decision process of who am I going to look for and why am I going to look for them? Uh, then let's move over to, we have a question on, um, can we use crowdfunding like a marketing tool? Um, someone wants to take that on? I mean, for me, it is a marketing tool. You're basically, you know, you're being public about the fact that you are have a product. You're being public about the fact that you're raising money through these tools. So it's most definitely first a marketing tool before anything else. Anton, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's. I have been following a few of those uh, products, and uh, the disappointment was at the end of a certain product that, that did, it wasn't delivered on time. You know, people put in a little money. I did it as well, your small money. Uh, but it's, it's a marketing tool, uh, but it works against you if you cannot deliver because then you get disappointment within that channel. And uh, then, uh, then it's, it, it's a problem. It's a problem for your fans as well as yourself as a startup company. But it's a marketing tool. It can be used as a marketing whilst getting money. Okay. Then the next question is, um, could you please share some platforms for funding? Um, this is a really hard question, I think, because there are really, there, are, like I mentioned, there's over a thousand uh, European funding, crowdfunding platforms. There are various different websites. Um, what I will share in the chat is a um, resource list. So um, that's the startup resources list for that uh, Founders Institute keeps for a variety of different cities. Please go look at that. And then if you have questions specifically around uh, a funding project, it's going to be much more of a, what is a good fit to, for my project in terms of uh, a platforms and I would suggest you reach out to some of us to have that kind of discussion. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, Anton, do you have a platform that you particularly like? No, because we are uh, basically investing around the Dusseldorf area mm -hmm. and around means about, about, let's say, 200 kilometers, which also includes the Netherlands, and we pretty much know what kind of programs are in place. So if, if you come from Bavaria and you want to set up a startup company there, I know nothing about the, the local Bavarian programs. I know about the, 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 the German overall programs, the exist programs and not, there are many, many others. The, there is not one size with a, one list which fits all. So talk to, again, talk to people in the area where you live, go to the, the local founder institutes, go to the pitch 
uh, events, find out if there are any business angel networks, talk to VCs, which might be living in that area, and you have to find it out there because there are thousands of programs. Yeah. And I cannot recommend one. <laughs> no, I can't recommend one either. Yeah, I mean, you can just say, do that. And the project and the product type. Yeah. I know, you know, if someone came to me with a uh, biomedical product that had some physical components and was specific to either the German or the Northern European area, then I could say, yeah, Esculap, for example, is really a great platform and they have some great projects and funding because that's what they do. So yeah. it's really very specific to whatever you're doing or the region you're in or the states you're in. Um, yeah. Unless, Alexander, you have something that come, pops to mind? Um, I, I assume the question was mostly around crowdfunding platforms? I'm guessing so, yeah. yeah. Um, I think there's, there's, there's just so many crowdfunding platforms out there. Um, you know, Crowdcube, there's... Uh, Seed Invest, there's uh, Cedars. I think Cedars and this other company just uh, uh, one acquired the other. Funder Beam is a big one in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. I'm a, personally a huge fan of uh, AngelList on the investor side. You know that there's there's a bunch of tools out there, but they have recently uh, launched a tool for founders to raise money called RUVs, so mm -hmm. roll up vehicles. Yeah. So whoever is thinking of you know of, uh, of raising money can can do that as well and that could be limited to accredited investors only or that could be you know um, a pure crowdfunding um, campaign that's open to anyone even non-accredited investors so just go and check that out if, if that's something that applies to you so I think there's it really depends on what is it exactly that that you need uh, there's no platform that's going to um, guarantee you just listing the company and getting a ton of money that just doesn't work uh and i think there's a there's a common misconception that crowdfunding is somehow easier than venture than raising a venture capital round and it, it absolutely isn't um i think you can think of it in terms of and we touched upon this a little bit uh in terms of having a classical venture capital you know doing a venture capital round or going around and trying to raise money from vcs and angel investors and then on top of that, you also have to build a marketing campaign. So you have to make sure that your assets are clear. You have, you know, some amazing visuals. Then you have the the network to um, to communicate that to and to promote it. Uh, so it's it's very time consuming. It's very difficult, and it works for a very particular type of product, I think. And even then, there's there's just no guarantee. Uh, and just lastly, on yeah. that point, I feel like there's a it's a bit of a turnoff. For, for instance, for me, if I see that a product has done a crowdfunding campaign or has tried doing a crowdfunding campaign, it hasn't really materialized all, all that well, I kind of feel like, well, you know, why did you go down the crowdfunding uh, way unless they can really justify that and say, well, we achieved X, Y, Z because of the crowdfunding uh, campaign. And it was a, it was a street strategic decision and not purely for capital. Then I'm, you know, I'm, I'd be more interested to hear more, but most of the time I feel like it's just because the founders run out of options or they didn't really know how to raise money, which is uh, a red flag, obviously, early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, you talk, you, you mentioned uh, the angel list RUVs uh, product, which is very recent that they brought that out. And it's, uh, I think that that's also something you need to think about. It makes me think that one of the things people need to think about when you're looking at a platform is, um, the structure you have for your company and where you're based will also impact the types of platform that you're going to use. The AngelList product is specifically oriented towards um, uh, Delaware C structures in the US. Uh, you don't want to be doing that if you're a, a German uh, GmbH uh, simply because it's the, the legal aspects are really too complicated to use those tools for that. Um, so when you look at platforms, also consider how you've incorporated your company or the other way around, incorporate your company in a way that you're going to be able to use uh, these funding tools. Think about where you're going to be, where your clients are going to be, how you're going to fund your company. Those should all be aspects of how you are going to create your structure. Uh, then 
we had a question about the uh, the our Founder Institute program. Is it a viable viable option if there's no team in place? Uh, and Karina answered that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, intended for solo entrepreneurs or for teams. Uh, you can find a co-founder through the program. Uh, the idea here is you you have it. Hopefully, you have you think you have a solid idea, and we will help you test it and figure out if it's if it's really something that um, will have wings. Uh, but you can definitely begin as a um, solo entrepreneur at the beginning. Um, then back to the questions around funding. Um, how should one approach an angel investor for a social startup uh, developing mobile games with uh, over 300,000 downloads? Um, that's a lot of downloads. That's a very specific question, um, Imran. Um, in terms of, maybe you can add a little bit about this, but in terms of a social startup, um, I would say, you know, there's funding for, there's specific funding programs for social startups. So you need to figure out if you're, one of the difficult things that occurs is that uh, you have investors that are going to invest in processes or structures that are easy to understand. They understand a marketplace, they understand a SaaS, uh, a gaming platform, a social project. When you begin mixing things up, um, it's very easy to say, no, I'm not interested because it's the other thing. And I'm just an investor of type A types of companies. So you, you may need to figure out um, what your positioning is and clarify your positioning so you actually do fit within a category. Um, Anton or Alexander or Vidya, do you have different opposing thoughts? Vidya, your product was kind of a, a mix of yeah. different things. It, it, I mean, I would say that it was a social tech startup or it is a, still a social project or a product. Um, for me, it, was, it is like, um, it seems that um, uh, Imran has, uh, uh, has games and some part of that uh, percentage of what they earn goes to the NGO project. So it's a little bit like a marketing uh, possibility that I see. I don't know if it uh, necessarily the games part fits the social impact investors. Um, I think social impact investors, if you want to go and approach them, they want to see um, the effect of your product or the games you create for changing things for the better. Like the there are the 17 uh, sustainable development goals from the United Nations, like no poverty, no hunger, um, you know, you want to have good health and environment, protect environment and against global warming and so on. Um, so it has to affect one of the 17 uh, goals in order for you to really say you are a social startup, I would say. I mean, if it doesn't affect, if your games are not doing anything in that regard, then it's a product. And it's a nice thing that you're giving some part of your earnings to the uh, social NGOs and so on. But I would say that these are two different things. Okay. Uh, Marie asks, uh, we're building a SaaS app that enables the on the ground workforce. We have a product market fit, lined up customers and key technology partners. We're struggling to move fast enough to build. Uh, where speed is critical to deliver to existing demand, is this a case for raising capital, debt capital? Um, or what would you, what would be the best avenue of raising capital in this case? I can um, I can comment on this. Well, if you so, need money in order to expand, yeah, do it. Go ahead. Sorry, I think my connection is lagging. So, Anton. Go ahead, Anton. And we'll take Alexander right afterwards. Yeah. Um, if you need money in order to expand and you have a product, then uh, it should be not easy, but easier that, to get some money from investors, whether it is VCs or uh, business angels, than not having a product. 
and you have a good case say look if we have so much money we can do this this and this and we grow faster and we can make the reach break even point earlier and we can start making money earlier so that that should not be a, a real big issue a lot of work of course to do all the financial uh, projections and the motivation why you want it but if speed is uh, critical as the question says then make sure you get money and start doing it therefore again back to the first question when to start with raising money as soon as possible <laughs> this sounds a little bit we're almost too late elite not too late but late Alexander? Yeah, I think that um, I mentioned that earlier that uh, if you're post product market fit, then uh, unless you've messed up your cap table and unless there's something else uh, um, that would prevent you from doing so, um, or maybe you're just generally not a venture backable company, then it should be l relatively easier to raise capital. And I think that if you can prove that by raising an X amount, you're going to accelerate the growth of the company because you're going to ship faster and you're going to meet uh, existing demand much faster, then it becomes a, um, a very compelling and very uh, nice story to VCs. And I'm sure that a lot of investors are going to at least, you know, take the first call and be interested in learning more. Um, so I'm not sure if that was uh, if that was the question here, because uh, is this a case for raising capital? Yeah, um, debt capital again. It all the, it, this is a really strategic decision. If you have, let's say, you know, if you've gotten to a stage where you have given up a lot of equity already, um, and uh, you don't want to dilute yourself before, let's say, a large Series A or Series B, and you have enough cash flow to, uh, you know, to um, to be able to. Um, pay uh, you know the interest in uh, on on a, on a potential debt capital um, or revenue based financing whatever it is that you that you decide to go after then I'd say by all means do it if you don't then you know make sure that um, you don't put yourself in a position where that debt is really slowing you down or and worse it's just jeopardizing the, the overall existence of the company because debt is debt um, and you know venture capital is also debt but uh, or, you know, especially in the early stages, if you do a safe, but it's just much more accommodating to an early stage startup. So keep that in mind. Um, I think that works, but for later, typically later stage companies. Yeah, then let's, um, and I would say, you know, um, the ability to build your product quickly, assuring that you don't lose out on your uh, product revenue, you know, that can, that can have significant, significant impact on the growth of your company. So you need to do that analysis. You need to work out your projections and figure out uh, what happens if you don't grow quickly and what happens if you don't meet, meet those customers. Are you going to lose those customers or not? So it's going to be a very specific answer around an analysis, a strategic analysis that you're going to do. I think that's just a, a bit of an echo of what Alexander and you were saying. Um, Final very... remark, maybe, uh, Eugene, yeah, go ahead. On, on this. If you have a good case, go back to the people who have financed your company until now and say, look, thank you very much. You've invested in my company. But if you invest, you and the other investors, a little bit more, we can do this. So we reach profit, a bit of break even, etc. cetera. We, we had such a case in, uh, in our... Um, angel engine family and uh, they came back to us and said look we're growing we can grow faster but we need more money and then the original uh, investors chipped in and gave them more money okay. that's an option that's the easiest one because you know the people yeah i think that's a good example uh, then in a, in a different area, um, how do you find potential med tech investors uh, via LinkedIn or are there, there any specialized platforms? Um, so it really depends. So med tech is one of the areas where I work in. Um, it really depends on the product and the type of 
work you're doing, but I'm going to put in the um, in the chat one of the companies that is involved. Again, this is a bit of a specialized crowdfunding. Uh, it's actually a limited crowdfunding. Um, but take a look at Esquivest. They do funding on the European level and based in Germany around uh, medical tech. Um, in general, there are you're going to spend a bunch of time on LinkedIn or on uh, NFX Signal NFX or on uh, AngelList, looking at potential investors. You're going to be looking at Crunchbase, and then there are tools like um, Founder Suite um, that allow you to run your funding as a um, structured process, uh, you know, as a marketing process. So there are potentially a bunch of different specialized tools that you'll end up using other than just LinkedIn and an Excel sheet. Um, but really consider, my recommendation there would be consider having a conversation with somebody that has already raised and ask them, how did you do it? What are the tools that you used? Uh, particularly in specialized areas like, um, like med tech, um, you know, med tech development tends to be a slow process. Getting to market is a slow process. The sales cycle in medical devices is uh, in medical software is a very slow process because you know you're going to have either a validation process to make sure your product is uh, approved uh, by a, a variety of different agencies, or your purchasing uh, process is very slow. So you need to have investors that understand that. Um, Karina, you wanted to talk about ICOs in Singapore? I have actually not a lot of experience there. So I, I'm, I don't know if in the German jurisdiction, ICO is legalized. Maybe the, 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 the panelists here knows. Um, what I've understood is that crypto is not considered yet um an asset that uh, that you are <laughs> that you can raise money from there are some organizations that accept already crypto in germany for payments so education institutions but yeah it's a good it's a good question i have no idea honestly speaking anyone here would like to chip in No. I'm going to say, you know, I don't have no experience with uh, uh, this type of raising. Yeah. I have one uh, I... experience where we did not, not succeed. So that's not helpful. I, I think the overwhelming majority of those projects did not succeed. And um, I, I wonder what, you know, if the question is around specifically around a blockchain based uh, project and if so what the use case would be but that that would probably be the number one question you know um, does that way of raising money make sense specifically for um for whatever it is that you're building i don't think that icos are necessarily bad or useless i just feel that they have gotten a bad rep just because un being unregulated from like two or three years ago they just exploded and there was a bunch of nonsense that was raising money for that. So uh, I, I had a close friend of mine who did a, a quite successful ICO and ended up raising something like 26 million. Um, but they had a, you know, a specific use case or so it sounded, I'm not really sure where they're at today. Um, it just sounded like they raised a ton of, a ton of money and uh <laughs> you know, went on to build the product. So I'm not really sure the people that hold the coin other than being able to speculate or trade it on some of these platforms, if there's really a use case. And I feel like that's still something to be proven, but um, I may be wrong. You know, my experience is also very anecdotal with it. Yeah. Okay. I think then with that last question, we're going to uh, close our session. I'd like to thank you all for participating. I think we had some great questions. And then I would suggest if you have additional questions or um, then you reach out to the uh, panelists or if you have questions around the 
FI program, reach out to Vidya, myself, Carolina, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, help you out. Thank you so That's much. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank and you have yeah, a Merry great Christmas. end of the year. Yes. And then we'll catch you in uh, 2022.